I remember the the Positive Punk article, the infamous Positive Punk article, and I remember uh, when the photograph for the cover was uh, was taken uh, by a chap called Anton Corbin, who uh, subsequently became quite famous for. Um, Joy Division, uh, that kind of stuff, really. But in any case, we we uh, <clears throat> we all met round. I think it was either Bob Shaw or some kind of Blood and Roses type person's flat or house in um, <clears throat> North London, uh, maybe Stoke Newton, North East London, that would be, I guess. Um, and we kind of hung around, waited, and Anton turned up, and everybody, Blood and Roses and Brigandage, really. And me, um, we were all kind of like hanging out, really, all in our finery, um, <clears throat> in our lovely clothes, with our lovely hair. And uh, Anton turned up, and he was very, he was actually quite sort of arrogant, really, and he was quite disdainful. And um, he was kind of giving off sort of not great vibes at all, and he was a bit of a downer. And I think that that is because um, well, he was around, you know, quite early, and he took photos of the of the pistols and all that kind of stuff. And I think that he was one of these people who thought that, um, well, you know, who are these people saying that they're still still saying they're punks, you know? And punks dead, punks boring, and <clears throat> I'm into I'm into, you know. The post-punk or, or whatever he was into, you know, and um, and that's because he didn't. I don't. He didn't have much invested in in punk rock to start with. He, he just kind of took it as something that he could kind of snap, really. And he didn't see. I don't think he took much meaning from from it. But positive punk was a collection, a loose collection of uh, of people who did um, actually take punk quite seriously in in those days um, but they took it they took it quite seriously well we took it quite seriously as a, as a vehicle for for change within the punk idiom um, but we wanted to do it in a, in a in a stylish way in a fun way and you know a progressive progressive way and that's what was so that's what was so positive about it it wasn't, you know, we didn't want to be new romantics and dress as, uh, as teapots or whatever. We, 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 we wanted to, we wanted to be kind of, you know, straight, we were punks, we were punks, it was just a continuation of that and, you know, so we were positive and we were punks. So there you go, that's, that's what positive punk was and it was lovely, yeah. it was a beautiful thing. Uh, and I'm going to kiss him. <laughs> Alright. So let's talk about UK Decay. UK Decay are a Luton fan. And um, we were talking just now. You, the audience, missed this. But Mickey Penguin and I, and Tony, Tony D, we were talking about a UK Decay gig that uh, there was actually football chanting in uh, in the audience this is and that, that 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 gig probably was the Luton Festival outside gig in um, 1981 it would have been 1981 and what happened was I was there I, I was I was there uh, and I even got up on stage and danced uh, for one song, and you can even see it on on YouTube, and it's not a pretty sight. I tell you, I had a lot to drink that night. I was, well, actually, it was during the day; it was the afternoon. But in any case, what happened was there were lots of punks that turned up from um, all over, including uh, Oxford, the Oxford Mental Mob, as they were called, and. Um, the Leighton Buzzard, the LU, LU7 Punks, as they were called. They were the Luton Punks, or the Luton Belts, as, uh, as they're known now. And, uh, and it was me, I was there. I was kind of like, uh, originally from Dunstable, which is just down the road, but um, I, I had been living in London since 1978, but I came back for the gig. 
because it was great, you know, and it was great. It was brilliant. And um, kind of why it goes down in infamy is the, uh, a load of Luton fans who, who drank in a pub called The Castle, I think it was at the time, loads of them, they came down and they were the people chanting, we are the town, we are the town, we are the town. But, I mean, Abbo, I remember, said quite wittily, witty, wittily from stage, so are we. Uh, because, you know, he was a Luton fan and I, I was a Luton fan, certainly, and loads of people, the punks, uh, were also Luton fans. And, um, in any case, these Luton guys started attacking the punks. But, uh, which is kind of a bit unfortunate for them, really, because uh, the Oxford Mental Mob aren't cool the Oxford Mental Mob for nothing, really. And the LU7 punks were also pretty tough, and so were the Luton punks. And not on more than one occasion, they'd given skinheads, football fans, a real pasting in the town. I mean, these people weren't a walkover. <clears throat> and you can actually see it again on YouTube, the fighting. And you can, there's this guy I remember called Dave Barr, who was from LU7, Leighton Buzzard. He was a, the guy was a boxer, he was an amateur boxer, and you can see him like reveling in the fact that these football hands are attacking them. Because, I mean, this guy had a left, left hook from heaven, or hell, if you were a, a, a Luton fan. And you can see people kind of attacking him because he's a small guy, and you know his left foot, left hook was beautiful. These guys didn't know what hit them, so oh fuck, we're going to keep away from this guy in the future. So that was quite funny, and you can see that on YouTube. But UK Decay, they were great. They were a, they were a local band, and the first time I met uh, the singer Abbo was in a pub in Dunstall. And um, I was wearing Adam and the Ants badge, and he, he said, um, he came up and he said, oh, have you seen the Ants? And this was, yeah, this was 78, and I said, yeah, actually, I have. Which is kind of unusual for a place like Dunstable or Luton in 1978, because not, not that many people would, but, um, but I had, and so had he. So we kind of bonded over Adam and the Ants, and then, and then um, I, I kind of, you know, I... I became friendly with them and I, I loved them and I think it was I think the important thing about UK Decay apart from the fact they had some really good songs was it's important to the, 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 it's important to remember and recognize your roots where you come from and you support where you are you support where you're from and you support your friends and that was UK Decay <laughs> Um, the UK decay, it, it all ended um, at the end of uh, 1982, and um, it was kind of like, a, it was two last gigs at the, the Clarendon, and I went to the first one, I didn't go to the second, and I went to the first one, and I think that was the one, uh, that was the one with um, the Sisters of Mercy and Blood and Roses uh, supporting, and it was, it was great, you know. Uh, and I knew it was going to be, I knew it was going to be the last gig, um, because Abbo told me, but um, then um, Spawn, the guitarist, turned up and I was living in a place called Westphere Road in West Hempstead at the time with um, with Tony D, Mr. Tony D, who's sitting there. And uh, he turned up, because it was kind of on his way from Luton to, to London, this is Spawn, and I said, oh, I can't go, and the reason I, I didn't go was uh, was because I went to see Brigandage at um, the Moonlight. Uh, I, went at, I went to the Moonlight Club. Tony and I uh, walked down there. It was a short walk, which again was kind of like an attraction. It was kind of like a local thing, really. You know, rather than schlepping to to West London, horrible. Um, and and saw Brigandage, and you know, uh, kind of like ten people, fifteen people there, and. Um, and I kind of figured, um, when I, I reviewed it for the enemy and gave it a, a, like a really good review. Um, uh, and um, 
I kind of figured it's it's the future and the past, and you got to know. You got to know when to move on. You got to know when to leave the past behind, kids, people. You gotta you gotta grab the magic, and that's uh, that's what I did. Um, Is Magic and Healing Practice by Alistair Crowley and um, the woman who sold them to me um, she said look the books that you've chosen if you if you were stuck on a desert island if you were all alone if you had no friends or company or anything like that these books would would keep you going they would um, see you right um, and um, I think she was probably kind of right there, there's so much in in both of those books it's it's absolutely amazing but the thing that I really took um, from uh, Alistair uh, especially I mean, you could sense that he was kind of like a flamboyant guy, uh, but he was uh, flamboyant with a bit of depth, uh, a bit of experience. He was a bit of uh, rough as well as a bit of smooth, kind of intellectually, physically, which I kind of liked. You know, it's kind of it's good having a kind of balance in this. And you know, he he didn't really care that much. He 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 wanted to. He lived his life as he felt that he should. Uh, and of course, this was a perfect match for the punk rock. And um, it, uh, you know, in in one in one afternoon, I had taken um, the two uh, important um, uh, ideological ideas um, or strain of ideas that w that would last me up until now, which. Uh, it's a kind of idea of, um, of punk rock, um, you know, to, to taking you beyond parameters. And Alistair, who uh, the whole idea of magic, just really not kowtowing to um, to science, to rules. It was it was it was they're 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 the same. They're one in the same thing to me. Magic, punk rock, disorderly magic. You know it. So, uh, to me, uh, the most impactful thing that um, Alistair Crowley said, and he said it directly to me, well, kind of, well, in any case, it was every man and woman is a star. And um, that, it doesn't mean that everyone is going to be in the future uh, a kind of TikTok celebrity or any of that kind of thing. What he actually meant was that um, everyone has their orbit, and if, if it doesn't matter what what you do, if you are on your orbit, on the on the on the arc, on the orbit that you are meant to be on then all is going to be well and not only is all, all going to be well with you all is going to be kind of well in a wider sense in, in, in culture and society if you like and it's when people become kind of disjointed from their orbits for various reasons that's when when things go wrong and and my book looking for a kiss is is, is exactly that that's what it's about it's about it's about two people who um, in post-punk times have um, have lost track of uh, of their own arcs, and they're 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 looking desperately to somehow reconnect with that arc at a time that the culture that they had uh, been involved in, which was punk rock, had also. Um, lost track of its arc and and was trying to again to find itself so it's about how culture and uh, in a personal sense these arcs intertwine and um, 
It's about looking for a kiss, looking for your ark, looking for redemption, looking, just seeking. <laughs> and that's looking for a kiss. Brigandage. Um, so, um, my period in Brigandage, uh, I played on um, the FYM tape, which kind of did well. It, it sold loads and it could have sold more when people really kind of dug it. And um, I played on the LP, which, uh, which didn't make uh, as much of an impact. Uh, really, I think it's time is up. I think the, the tape was 1984 and the LP was 1986. And I joined the, the band after uh, Michelle had got slung out of the uh, original brigandage. And she kind of um, asked me to play bass. And I wasn't really a musician, although, you know, these days I'm not bad. But I, I you know, um, and I kind of. Uh, I kind of stepped in. Um, the thing about Brigandage as a, as a band, uh, the original band, I suppose, and to, to a small extent, a lesser extent, the, the, the kind of second Brigandage, uh, my Brigandage that I was in, uh, to a smaller extent, was it was instant nostalgia. It was for it was for it was for people who wanted to um, to capture that original spark of, uh, of punk rock including the fashions and the, and the haircuts and um, uh, all associated with sex pistols which is all, all kind of a shell really I mean you know she was um, she was uh, an obsessive in, in that respect and I'm guessing she still kind of is really. Uh, and uh, you know it was it was instant nostalgia and it was really weird because it was only like you know a few years after 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 it all happened you know I'm not sure I'm not sure why people would want to to go down that um, nostalgia route at that time because punk was uh, was not um, it was, wasn't a nostalgic um, avenue uh, which kind of made it inspirational, which is why Brigandage were all very niche. It was a very it was a very it was a very niche kind of business being in that band. And um, I kind of enjoyed it more because we kind of got away from that and expanded it and um, expanded some of the some of the ideas and um, kind of musically I suppose and, and especially by the LP it, it um, it moved completely uh, away from that instant nostalgia <coughs> of the Sex Pistols, and it kind of, you know, it sounded. Um, it was. It, it took that nostalgia a step back by sounding like the Velvet Underground, which was, you know, <laughs> kind of reversing into the future, if you want. But for us, it was a kind of step forward. But nobody dug it. Nobody got it. And it was just before everyone in the whole world started to sound like. The Velvet Underground and and like them, and um, so we kind of we kind of missed that. Um, but you know, pretty funny thing is is um, well, you know, I stand by it. I mean, it's 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 a brave and um, valuable musical effort. So that's uh, that's my take on Brigandage. <laughs>